Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rail's Common Ground. I'm Malva Kajali, Special Projects Associate here at the Rail, and today I have the, uh, I'm thrilled to be kicking off a new monthly series, Publishing in Transit, curated by our friend, writer, and translator Cole Swenson. Uh, the series will feature deep dives behind the scenes of literary publishing, featuring editors and writers of different presses. And for our first episode, I have the pleasure of welcoming Edwin Frank, writer and editorial director of New York Review Books, who is joined by two of his authors, Arvind Krishna Merotra and Eugene Ostashevsky. Uh, as a special treat today, before we open to the Q&A, we'll get to hear our three featured writers read from their work. Uh, so looking forward to that. Finally, we've started out all of our uh, events here at the Rail with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wapinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. And I think it's worth saying that the heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom. In that spirit, I encourage you to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions that we've been uh, putting together here at the rail. Um, but now, you know, I'll get right to it. It's my honor to welcome our wonderful curator of this series. Uh, poet Cole Swenson is the author of 17 volumes of poetry and one collection of critical essays, Noise That Stays Noise. Uh, and meeting right in the middle of those two uh, forms is a book of hybrid poem essays titled Art in Time, which came out just last month with Night Boat. I'll drop a link in the chat. Please check it out. Uh, a former Guggenheim Fellow, she's been a finalist for the National Book Award and received the Iowa Poetry Prize, the National Poetry Series Prize, and uh, many others. She's translated over 20 volumes of poetry, prose, and art criticism from French. And here she is to translate the secrets of publishing for us all. Uh, so Cole, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malika and Nick and Fong in absentia for um, being interested in this project and uh, putting it together with me. Uh, I think it's gonna be really fun. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all for coming uh, and joining us in this first edition of our publishing and translation. Uh, and we're going to be focusing on editors or once a month, a different editor. Uh, our intention is to celebrate the act of editing. Uh, editors are the most important link, you might say, in the whole cycle of literary publishing, and yet they're also often the least visible. So our intention in this series is to raise that visibility, to celebrate them and to underscore the amazing and complex job that they do that is the only way we get the literature that feeds us so well. So um, we'll be starting with 30 minutes of listening in on a discussion uh, between Edwin Frank, the founding editor of New York Review Books, and two of the writers and translators, Eugene Ostrzewski and Arvind um, Marotra, um, in translators and uh, poets that he has published. We'll listen in on that for about 30 minutes. And then we'll hear short readings from each of the three of them. And then at around two o'clock, we'll open it up to extend the conversation to you all and hope you'll join us in that. So I'm gonna to move to uh, an introduction. I'm gonna introduce each of the three. Uh, and so we are not having to interrupt the program with the introductions as we go. So I'm starting with Eugene. Eugene Otyshevsky sometimes introduces himself as a pundit because he says his principal literary mode is the pun, an approach to language that's connected to the fact that as he puts it, English will always be his second skin. Although he writes only in English, his first language was Russian. He was born in Leningrad in 1968 and in 1979, emigrated to the United States with his family, settling in New York City. Slippage between and among languages continues to be an active element of his life. He currently lives in Berlin with his family, a household in which English, Russian, German, Turkish, and German sign language are all used. And he's remained committed to Russian literature, particularly 20th century absurdism. He edited and translated most of the work in the volume Oberyu, an anthology of Russian absurdism, published by Northwestern in 2006. 
and with Matvey Yankelevich translated Alexander Badetsky's An Invitation for Me to Think, which was published by NYRB in 2014 and won the Alta National Translation Award. Also published by NYRB is his 2017 translation of children's verse by Vladimir Mayakovsky, Asip Mandelstam, and Daniel Carnes, titled The Fire Horse. <laughs> Books of his own poetry include Literature and The Life and Opinions of DJ Spinoza, both published by Ugly Duckling Press. And in 2017, NYRB published his The Pirate Who Does Not Know the Value of Pie. It's a hybrid poetic work based on the lively repartee between a pirate and a parrot. Once asked why he referred to the book as multilingual, he replied that though it's almost entirely in English, it's in many, many Englishes from hip hop to Elizabethan to set theory. He got his PhD from Stanford and teaches in liberal studies at NYU, though he spent this past spring semester teaching in Shanghai. Arvind Krishna Marotra was born in Lahore in 1947, the year of Indian independence, and grew up in Allahabad and Bilal. While still a student at the University of Allahabad, he and two friends started a poetry journal titled Damn You, a magazine of the arts. Later in Bombay, he edited another journal, Ezra, and published pamphlets under the imprint of Ezra Fakir Press. He was an active member of a group that came to be known as the Bombay Poets. In the 1970s, with other members of the group, Marotra founded a poetry publishing collective called Clearing House in order to create a platform for the works of contemporary Indian poets. He's worked throughout his life to bring Indian literature to as wide an audience as possible through both editing and translating. His major editing projects include the Oxford India Anthology of 12 Modern Indian Poets, the History of Indian Literature in English, and the Book of Indian Essays, 200 Years of Indian Prose. He's translated more than 200 literary works from Prakrit, Bengali, Hindi, and Gujarati, including The Absent Traveler, Prakrit Love Poetry, which was published in 2008 by Penguin Classics, and Songs of Kabir, which came out from NYRB in 2011. His own poetry is marked by extreme clarity and precise attention, often focused on daily objects and events close at hand. His work has been published in six volumes, most recently Selected Poems and Translations, which came out from NYRB in 2020. He's also an essayist and has published two volumes, Partial Recall, Essays on Literature and Literary History, and Translating the Indian Past, which appeared in 2019. He was for many years a professor at the University of Allahabad before retiring in 2012. He currently lives in Dehradun, where he has been sitting out the pandemic in his garden. And uh, Edwin Frank. Edwin Frank was born in Boulder, Colorado into an academic family in which books abounded. He began reading very early and books quickly became central characters in his life, even offering a kind of haven during some lonely passages in his childhood and adolescence, such as the years he spent living overseas, first in Paris and then much later in London while his parents did research on sabbaticals. He's compared books to birds, dipping and swerving and riding currents of air, and he's compared them to boxers, dodging and fainting, and generally engaging in fancy footwork. And he has compared the shifting interaction between reader and text as akin to playing chess. What intrigues me about all of these analogies is how active they are. They're all, in a sense, inventive and stylized versions of dance. For, while from the outside, reading may appear to be a passive procedure, Clearly, Edwin Frank recognizes that the process requires participation at every level of the self, body, mind, and soul. Given that thorough and visceral engagement, it's not surprising that he's made making books a driving theme of his life. 
I won't go into the history of the press because as every press is a story in itself, I'd rather that we heard it directly from him. But I will just say that he began it in his mid thirties with a desire to rescue wonderful works from the endless limbo of out of printness. New York Review Books, especially its classics and poetry series is marvelously vagabond, nomadically wandering continents and centuries covering vast territories of experience and imagination. Before moving on to that story, however, I should cover some basic biographical information. After post high school travels through Mexico and Latin America, Edwin went to Harvard and after graduation went on to a stigma fellowship at Stanford. And then as he puts it, spent many years at Columbia not getting a PhD in art history. His first foray into publishing was running a small poetry press, a left books with a friend that he started in the mid 1990s. He's published poems and essays in many journals and is the author of three books of poetry, The Further Adventures of Pinocchio, Stack and Snake Train, poems 1984 to 2013. He's also edited various collections, including unknown masterpieces, writers rediscover literature's hidden classics, and in 2019, to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the press, The Red Thread, 20 years of NYRB classics. He divides his time and presumably his library between New York City and the upper Hudson Valley. And now to turn to you, Edwin, let me start by observing that while most presses focus on a given genre or style or some other identifying feature, New York Review Books is distinguished by the amazing range in time, space, tone, and approach that it covers. Could you tell us how the press came about and particularly how it achieved this amazing eclectic nature? And you're muted. There we go. Thank you so much. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Thank you, uh, everybody at the rail for sponsoring this event. And thank, thank you all, in the, all, all you in the audience for coming to, um, to this event with uh, Arvind and Eugene and me. It's, it's odd to be um, sort of put in the spotlight as an editor. So, um, but um, it's an interesting, interesting, it's an interesting new experience in a way. Um, so NYRB, I mean, the publishing program began now, what, 21 years ago or so, and, um, or is it 22? A long time ago, long enough for me to forget, um, and grew out of a project called the, the Reader's Catalog, which was a sort of Sears catalog of a bookstore. It was meant to be the 40,000 best books in print. And uh, that had been computerized about the time I started working on it, and I had a job sort of reading through the sections of this bookstore, this paper, this virtual bookstore, um, and sort of saying which books should or shouldn't be there. And a lot of books that I thought should be there weren't there. Uh, and then not knowing uh, back in this day when I was still busily not getting a PhD in art history, that the reasons books went out of print typically was because they didn't sell. Um, I thought there was a sort of conspiracy amongst um, the, the unwashed and the Philistine, who knows what, to, um, uh, to sort of, you know, get rid of these, um, to, to uh, forget these books. Uh, I suggested that we start putting books that were, were clearly good books back into print. And, um, and we started, that's how the whole series began as a reprint series. Uh, and it did surprisingly well. There was a lot of interest. It's an interesting, uh, interesting moment because I think in some way a lot of books became had gone out of print became available because um, publishing was being corporatized and big corporate houses were paying no attention to their backlist. Um, they were looking at books that would be blockbusters. So those books became available and and becoming available at that moment. There seemed to be something in the air about people taking a, a new interest in precisely what publishers were no longer giving them. And I'm not quite sure why that should have been at that point, but um, it, uh, there certainly was a growing interest over the first 10 years of this century in work in translation, still amongst a small group of people, but certainly a larger group of people. And you began to see more coverage of it in, 
in periodicals and um, and we have benefited from that as have excellent uh, presses like um, Archipelago and uh, UDP, Ugly Duckling Press, um, which um, with whom uh, Eugene has also published a book uh, and so on. So that was the context in which all of this sort of came together. I began publishing some books of poetry in the classic series um, intermittently, but the classic series is, as you said, it's meant to mix things up in every conceivable way. So I wanted books of poetry alongside books sometimes dismissed as merely um, as children's books, because children's books could be great books. And of course, and Eugene may want to talk a bit about the great, um, how often in Russia, uh, the great poets have been writers of children's book. It's, it's been a major, um, uh, a major um, uh, genre for them, partly because it was a place to hide out. You could write children's books when your other books weren't publishable. Um, but um, sometime around, well, I guess we started the poetry series in 2013, and I'd been uh, mulling it over, mulling over doing a poetry series for some time, partly in response to two things that, that had struck me and that I started thinking about in relation to how perhaps people, readers of poetry or non-readers of poetry had come to think about poetry. One was that the um, bigger presses um, like FSG, which of course has a fine list of poetry, had begun to produce a lot of um, tomes, great big books, all of Robert Lowell's letters or a huge chunk of them. And, and these books were on the one hand a service and on the other hand, one realized that as poetry was sort of disappearing into tomes, it was in some sense being entombed, that these were books that were not really meant to show up on, they, they, were, they would show up on the shelves of people who already had an interest, professional or, or a deep interest, uh, amateur, whatever, personal interest in poetry, but they were not, they were clearly, um, not going to uh, fall into the hands of your, 14 year old reader who was curious to see what poetry was. Um, at the same time, new poetry was more and more appearing in books that were, that on the one hand you could say uh, advantageously uh, highlighted the variety of forms poetry can now take. Books of very irregular trim, books that uh, were not so much tome-like as slab-like um, and, uh, and as I say, there's a good side to that, but there's also a way in which those books began to look to be a bit like, I think it's the Japanese who have these beautiful, beautiful presents that you give to people, which nobody's ever supposed to open. You just sort of take it and, and you put it on the side. And then at a certain point, I think it's legit to re-gift it too, because it's actually now become a, a present with a tradition almost. It's a sort of wonderful, it's a poetic idea, but perhaps not the best way to approach poetry. Um, so that had struck me as limitations of the, um, of the current poetry moment. The other thing that struck me that had mattered to me a lot when I was a young reader uh, that seemed to have disappeared or to seem to be disappearing increasingly from the American poetry scene was slim books, often compiled by other poets of um, canonical or indeed uh, completely far-fetched poets, but poets from the past, um, those sort of communicating vessels between past and present seem ever less present in American, uh, in American publishing. And whether it had been back in the day, uh, Signet Classics had had, you know, a great selection of Shelley, a great selection of, uh, which is where I certainly had cut my teeth of those. And in England, you still have to some extent very slender selections of who knows who, Herrick, Crabbe, uh, Marjorie Cavendish, um, Margaret Cavendish, um, a whole writ that these were, uh, that these kinds of, these books had disappeared from the market and that seemed a pity. The only thing you saw like them were now more or less academic course adoption books done by Penguin, which could be very good additions, but were also clearly not meant for the passionate amateur. Um, so that was what we, uh, in some sense, and we, uh, I mean by we, that at the beginning of the series, and still uh, he works along, along with me, Jeffrey Yang was very much involved. He was also still working at, at New Directions. He still edits books occasionally for us. Um, but at the beginning, I brought on Jeffrey Yang because we needed, because uh, we 
publish a lot of books and it's more than um, one or two that people can handle. So uh, we began with a reprint, with, though in the event that's something that actually has not been very characteristic of the poet series, of the um, poems of Miguel Hernandez uh, that had been translated by Don Scher uh, back at the beginning of, I think even back in the 90s. Um, and uh, Hernandez is a poet from the great generation of Spanish poets uh, with Lorca and so on, but one to whom less attention has, has been paid uh, than to uh, certainly to Lorca and um, and so we started with that soon after we followed with um, uh, uh, Eugene and Matvey's uh, Viedensky. Um, let me say before beginning sort of the conversation a few the other issue is you know I the classic series is a series I've grown accustomed to publishing books in a series this is partly a practical matter because actually if you don't have to redesign every single book you do you have time to um, you have more room uh, more time uh, with the classic series we do uh, Sarah Kramer and I figure out all the art for the covers which is actually a fair amount uh, which is a fair amount of work the fun work in its own right uh, but I really felt that with doing 25 or 26 classics, that if we're going to do six or seven poetry books a year, we should not have to do cover art. We should have a common design, but we should not have to do cover art. I also actually, but I, I so I wanted a typographic design and we went to Emily Singer, who, um, who gave us the design and Eugene has held up his book, but you'll see here, um, we have a typographic design where you have you know, a block of color and the name of the author, sometimes a title, some, sometimes simply the name of the author. Um, the inspiration for the color was partly Surkamp in Germany, which does has always done beautifully colored uh, paperbacks. The other inspiration for the cover was the um, Cape books that Nathaniel Tarn uh, edited back in the late 60s and early 70s, a wonderful list of books that um, included Thing, you know, Breton, Levi Strauss. It wasn't only, it wasn't limited to um, uh, to poetry by any means, uh, and um, which was a series. I was quite young when those books came out, but they were available all through the seventies, um, and um, it certainly represents for me what I think publishing should do, which is put disparate things together in order to. Uh, um, cause people to take new thought, both about books, but also about the world at large, and also, as you said, about what it means to be a reader. Um, so in the case of poetry, I also wanted the books to be fairly small so that people could put them in pocket or purse and carry them around. I wanted them to be the opposite of tomes. Uh, I wanted them to be, in some sense, to be enter into the life, the life of readers uh, and be hanging around all the time. Um, and I wanted, um, I also wanted them to be colorful and eye-catching, and I wanted them possibly to look good together so that people would, you know, whatever, people would fetishize them and, and do, and do evil things like that, and put them on their shelves together just because they look, they look nice, as well as reading them. So that was, uh, very much the thought, and since then we've done, uh, in the seven or eight years that we've done, by my count, 39 books in some 14 languages, um, from some for they, 14 languages and some of them even in languages since we have bilingual uh, Chinese books and bilingual French books and bilingual Spanish books. Uh, so um, not only from other languages, but also in those languages. We have done a good number of uh, newly uh, commissioned books. I asked Michael, uh, one, one thread of the series is to, um, is to put into print, is to look at the curiously very far apart poetries of England and America, where there's often been a lot of uh, relatively little uh, uh, back and forth. So Michael Hoffman put together a selection of uh, W.S. Graham, the Scottish poet. Um, we also did one of Jeremy, uh, J., uh, J. R., uh, Jeremy Prynne's earliest, early books, uh, The White, White Stones, which Peter Gizzi introduced for us. Um, and then we did a, uh, an, an anthology of the new Greek poetry. Anyway, I've tried to, uh, as with the classic series, um, mix things up. One of the reasons I hope that, and I'm grateful to Arvind and uh, Eugene for coming is that they themselves are also, I mean, if you look at the uh, series as a kind of 
anthology making itself up or, 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 an or a kind of train adding cars as it goes along the way goes along. Um, the, um, both of them have, have not only worked, uh, as you said, uh, not only are they both wonderful poets, but they have also um, put together anthologies and thought about uh, bringing things to people's attention that otherwise people haven't done it. Um, so Arvind and I had worked together. And by the way, the other thing I want to say is the main thing an editor, it's nice to be praised editor. The main thing an editor gets to do is to, put, to discover wonderful writers and put them into print so that other people can discover them. And in, this, in, with, in the case of these two writers, as well as the other writers I published, that is of course the greatest gratification. Um, but Arvind and I had, um, worked together in the classics on the Kabir uh, book. And, um, uh, and then more recently uh, I published Arvind's book. So I was wondering whether Arvind would speak about his experience as a translator and as a poet in relationship between the act of, of uh, translating and writing poetry and, and perhaps read us one of his translations or a poem as he sees fit. Is Arvin there or is he muted? We lost him. Unmute. Unmute. Oh. There you are. Yeah. I'm. I'm audible. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. So. Uh, so what? Uh, I don't know. I. I. I think I started writing and translating at the same time. I wasn't particularly thinking of whether I was doing one thing or the other. They kind of happened simultaneously. Uh, Kabir happened in a strange way that I wanted to. This was I was I was very young. I was you know, not even in my twenties. I was just you know, 22, 23 maybe, and I was looking at uh, bilingual versions, prose translations, you know, done in the twenties. Not 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 the Tagore as yet, but some other translations, and I. And I kind of made up uh, some I, you know, uh, reworked from there. And I think I must have made up a few poems, which I then ascribed to Kabir. Now, which was a perfectly legitimate thing to do in hindsight, because a lot of people wrote their own poems and said Kabir says, rather than, you know, put their own names on the poem, they just said Kabir says. But so, so I was doing that, but I had still not quite, I was, you know, 21, 22, you know, I didn't know the language very well. I still don't, you know, I still don't know medieval Hindi. But I happened in the, on the little magazine circuit, I had heard of a journal called Delos. Has anyone heard of Delos? It was, it was a journal of and on translation, and it was from the University of Texas. It was edited by D.S. Khan Ross and David Vevel. And what was most striking about them were the, were the advisory editors, which was W.H. Orton, George Steiner, and, and Shattuck, Roger Shattuck. So I sent this to them and they published it in, uh, in, in Delos. So that was the first time I think I ever, you know, apart from mimeograph journals, I had published in something, a journal which had a spine. But then, but then this whole Kabir project collapsed because I went to Iowa and then enter Robert Bly and Bly showed me his Kabir from published by the Lilla Bulero Press, the fish in the water is not thirsty. So then the whole Kabir project collapsed till I still worked on it. And this is where the editor comes in. And this is what I would like to talk about. Till Edwin and I met, you know, in different circumstances, it had to do with Arun Kolatkar and the publishing of Jejuri. And Edwin asked me what, what you're working on. And I said, well, I have this Kabir. And then he said, well, if you ever do more, you know, could you show them to me? So you know, then 30, 35, 40 years later, a project which had, which had been abandoned was, was revived. That doesn't answer your question, does it? Uh, does it, Edwin? <laughs> yeah, well, it uh, it was. <laughs> nice how, it's interesting how these things hang fire for years on end, uh, and then yes, then there's a there's an opportunity and an occasion, and and uh, they come to be. And it was exciting how, in some sense, how quickly that came to be once 
once you began to work on it? Well, uh, the uh, outlines were. Well, you know, it happened quickly because I suddenly found my voice. And the voice was, do I bring in uh, anachronisms or I don't? You know, do I bring in the aftershave lotion into Kabir, into a medieval poet? But at the back of my mind was always Pound's frigid air patent. <laughs> in, uh, you know, <laughs> equipped with a frigid air patent, you know, homage to Sextus Bush. <laughs> right, so right. if he can do frigid air patent, you know, all those years ago, now, where's the harm? You know, why can't I take the same? Uh, why can't I approach my own, uh, well, my own, uh, my own writers or my own tradition, just the way Pound approached the, the Latin poets? So that was, but I'd never had the confidence to actually do it. Because once you open that door, then the whole thing opens, then the whole thing becomes different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, once you bring in the frigid air patent, uh, then, you, then you bring in the, the, the contemporary world. Yeah. So then, then does one bring that in? And the other question, other question was always of the of the idiom. You know, what language does one? This is what we were discussing the other day. Uh, what is the language you translate into? And for me, uh, as for a lot of Indian poets, it it has to be the American. Mm -hmm. There is no other language which gives us the same conversational tone, the con con the conversational idiom. Because in Indian English always sounds a little stilted, or it sounds it, it, it doesn't doesn't quite sound right. And and this is very interesting because Indians, you know, I was looking at Arun Kulhatkar's whom you published. You published Jejuri in uh, NYRB Classics, and looking at Arun's scribbles, I came across in the early fifties he was noting down American phrases. Hmm. Interesting, you know. I, I, uh, they just, you know, just, just jotting down American phrases. You know, why was a young poet who writes, wrote in Marathi and English, living in Bombay, jotting down phrases like, I've, I've got uh, spitting, spitting against the wind. And the, uh, the other one, you know, to high heeled good time and cotton picking shame. Now, here's this Indian poet living in Mumbai in the 19, you know, 51, 52 jotting down these American American phrases. It's obviously someone in search of a language. I so know that, that that's, you know, yeah, sorry. I was just gonna say, I, uh, I know that Eugene has been also yeah. thinking more specifically about the danger, the potential, what happens when you translate something into American. And I just thought I'd, maybe you wanna leap in Eugene and say something about this question, because it's on your mind as well. Well, I mean, I'm, okay, so maybe you saw that I was making an astonished face. <laughs> the astonished face is actually, it's, I mean, to me, it's just, um, okay, so basically what's going on here is you're choosing another dialect as the vernacular. That's just really weird, right? Normally it's your dialect that's the vernacular. Right, but but you're admiring the vernacular nature of American, whereas if Indian English feels stilted, I mean that in, I mean I don't know in terms of translingualism in terms of linguistics, that's super interesting. I mean it's just and I, um, so that's that's what I was noting. Um, but as far as translating into America, I don't have a problem with translating into American per se. Um, it's just that particular point I, th I think is very, very interesting. And I think that translating into a, translating medieval stuff into American also has another, a, apart from, you know, all sorts of interesting displacements, there's an additional aspect of oral, kind of more oral versus an extremely print culture, right? So uh, with Kabir, for example, um, it's, you know, in American English, it becomes a talk poem. 
but I'm wondering what it's like in medieval Hindi, whether it's a sung poem, an intoned poem, or also a talk poem. And that, that's a question. No, it's, uh, they are songs. They are, they are songs all the way. Yeah. And because they are songs, they are a bit like the blues. They change from singer to singer. So hence the text is unstable. Yeah, and I thought the says Kabir at the end, which I mean, uh, it's characteristic of uh, a poem that's about to become a folk poem, right? That's about to be repeated by other people that's going yes, to yes. have a life in the language. And this is a way of signing it. Like Villon does the same thing, mm -hmm. right? People in the 15th century did this, you know, not just in India, but but everywhere. Yeah, I know. Because this this is the way you maintain authorship uh, of a text that 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 you know will travel from lips to lips. So it's a sort of copyright. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. I, I'm sorry I to jump in. I know this is not my talk, but I I just wanted to say this is such a brilliant idea. Thinking of like the the trope of like the takhalas, like the putting the the signature in the poem as a as a copyright is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. Continue. Yeah, well, do, in terms of coming up with the language, I mean, one thing, by the way, that struck me as I was preparing for this is that uh, Arvin talks a good deal in his introduction to Kabir about the upside down language that Kabir employs and the, the sort of which is actually rather similar to the Oberu stuff and what you talk about in the Viedensky. And there's even a kind of negative theology thing going on in both, in both cases. And I wonder uh, whether you talk about the language you, you tried to find for those things in, in translating it uh, when you and Matfei were working on that book. Yeah, I mean, I thought there was a lot of similarity in, in that sense. And I also thought it was a similarity in the kind of very broader question of, okay, let's not go into what is poetry, but there are certain kinds of poetry uh, which emphasize uh, that kind of semantic uh, unrealism, this kind of semantic, like things not coming together, right? Um, and you can have very many, um, under that general rule, you can have very many different kinds of apophasis from something um, very, very modern, like metaphors, I don't know, even in Michael Palmer or something, or Beidou, right? To something very ancient, uh, like Kabir, right? And Vidyansky also belongs to um, the same broad uh, type of poetry, which has to do with nursery rhymes, right? In ultimately what it's about is saying, uh, maybe poetry starts where strict referentiality stops, right? And this is the point where language becomes free or, or something like that. And well, and becomes materially present too and certainly to a much greater right. degree than, than um, one is aware of with, with, with prose, which at least with narrative prose where the relative transparency is, is asserted. I wonder in terms of our, our uh, the, uh, whether we should turn to readings now, Cole, to, is it I think in terms of the and just get a sense of how the two of you um, hear language, whether as translators or um, uh, as poets yourselves, because um, it's, you know, we've talked about translation right now, but both of your, as Arvind said, his poetry is very involved with its sort of interlingual uh, things, and your poetry very much so, inc including, you know, becomes even macaronic as well as dealing with pastiches and, and so on. Um, so I, f I forget what was the order we were going to read, yeah, um, I, this discussion is so wonderful, I hate to have it stop, but maybe what we could do is kind of shift our format a little bit uh, and hear a few poems from 
Arvin, and then hear a few poems from Eugene, hear a few poems from you, Edwin, and then uh, maybe leave a little room for discussion that then we can segue into a discussion with the people joining us uh, on the Zoom. That sound good? Sounds good to me. So we'll start with Arvin. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll read uh, three poems, uh, two, two short, one. Uh, all these poems, all three poems have to do with this house in which I live. Uh, and they're all centered, centered on my mother. Uh, so the f there's no nothing to explain in this particular poem except a proper noun, belling. Belling is a British oven, uh, electric oven. Uh, the meal. You know the game's up when the house you live in begins to eat you. The timbered roof is the roof of its mouth, the pitted stone floor its rotted teeth, the front and back doors its knife and fork, cutting you into small pieces. You look up from the plate towards the belling on the sideboard where your mother is standing inside a walker, an unpaid bill in her hand, supervising the meal. The second poem, the second mother poem, is uh, called My Mother's New Bras. The old pomegranate storm hit, propped up with sticks, sends out a green shoot that goes straight and up from the root, but brings no hope for the stricken tree. It's the same for my 90-year-old mother, broken boned, assisted out of bed, she goes to the mirrored cupboard, straightens her back, and takes a long look at herself. Secretly, she once sent for some cotton bras that turned out to be a few sizes too big and were later found among her uranus clothes, unworn, stiff in their original folds. The last, slightly longer than the other two, is called In a Greek City, and uh, it takes place in Egypt, 315 AD, uh, the time of the Ptolemies. Bringing my face up against hers, who am I? I say to my mother. She's sitting on the edge of the bed, her legs swollen, stiff, the color of white stone, Nylos, she says, but why do you ask? Her big eyes, wide open, stare at me uncomprehendingly. Can't find my comb, she says. Have you seen it? Her right arms in plaster. The wind, sand filled, blows through the house, rattling the windows, opening and closing the unhinged panels of her mind. I give her the comb. In a gesture I know so well, her left palm bent at the knuckle, touches the hairline, ready to follow the comb's path through the tangles. But the hand has no grip and the comb slips. Shoulders hunched, hands in her lap, she looks like a child abandoned in a park. Let it be, we'll do the hair later, I tell her and go upstairs to get her breakfast, a cup of milk, honey cake, figs. She eats hungrily and I watch her eat, wiping her gummy mouth from time to time. A sweet talker with one sharp tongue, she spoke in many voices. Neighbors and slaves told her their stories. She was the keeper of gossip. No one now comes except the wind blows, the windows rattle, and she asks, where's mama, where's papa? Where are my sisters? They're dead, I tell her, matter of factly, as though reporting an incident in the street. Is that so, she says, her mind somewhere else. Get me something to eat, what do we have? But you've just eaten, see, you forget. She forgets that she forgets. 
whose house is this? She asks, where's my bedroom? When are we going back to number 16? You are in your own house, I tell her. You are in number 16, where you've always lived. Don't you recognize the garden, the stairs, the gospels on the shelf, Matthew and John? Shall I read out a passage? She looks tired. I ask her to walk to get some exercise, but she's adamant. My nose a no. That's more like her. When she lies down on her side, I roll up her vest, exposing her back, letting the disinfecting sun fall directly on her skin, where it's discolored, purplish, hard, one unhealing bed so oozing thickly. Thanks. Thank you very much, Arvind. That's wonderful. And we'll pass it over then to Eugene. Okay. Um, I'm going to read one translation um, and one poem. So this is a translation uh, from Vidyansky, where um, I tried to retain the meter, well, the rhythm not so much the meter. I try to retain the rhythm and uh, you can see the way that the sense and the nonsense really depends on, on the rhythm, on having the rhythm there. It's carried by the rhythm, carried by the music of the rhythm. It's called Guest on a Horse. And it's from uh, 31, 32, 33, 34, something like that. Horse of the Steppe runs tired, froth drips down the equine lip. Guest of the night, you expired. You suddenly vanished mid gallop. There was evening, I can't remember. Everything was black and proud. I forgot the existence of words, beast, water and stars. Everything was at a distance from me of many miles. I heard the hoofbeat of a horse. I didn't understand this horse message. I thought it was a test run of an object's transformation from iron into word, into noise, dream, drop of light, disaster, loss. The door opened, the guest entered alone. Pain pierced my bone. A man bends my way out of a man, stares at me like an echo, has a medal pinned on his back. He showed me with his inverse arm above the river in the dark, a fish upon its legs did pass, reflected as if in a glass. I heard the wardrobe and the door clearly say a horse's snort. I was sitting and I went like a planet onto a table, like a concept void of life, like a feather or a beetle to the universal Congress of all sciences and insects, mountains, forests, cliffs, and demons, birds and night, words and day. I'm glad, oh guest, so happy that I glimpsed the edge of the horse. It was smooth without riddles, clean and clear as a brook. It shook its mane a little strained and said, I'd like a bit of soup. I was the chairman of the Congress i come to the assembly, educate me, O oh creator, and got answered very well. Sideways turned the horse and I looked into its hand. The horse wasn't frightening at all. I decided I had sinned, meaning God deprived me of body, mind, and will. Yesterday came back to me. In boiling water, there was winter. In the stream, there was a prison. In the flower, diseases acute. In the beetle, a useless dispute. I didn't see meaning in anything. God, maybe you're absent, what a disaster. No, I saw it all at once. I picked up the day's mute vase. I spoke out a funny phrase, miracle loves to warm its heels. Light appeared, words appeared, the world was spent, the eagles fell silent. The man became a demon here in the meantime, like a miracle in an hour, disappeared. I forgot about existence. I again contemplated the distance. 
So, and now I'm gonna read a piece from the pirate who does know the value of pi, where you have two characters, a pirate and predictably a parrot, and they spend most of the book talking to each other or not talking to each other, as often happens with couples. Listen, parrot, said the pirate. The lights have gone out all over the ocean and we're alone. What shall I tell you that might fit the occasion? My piggy, porky, what was his name? The one that was with Winnie the Pooh. Piglet, says the pirate. Yes, says the pirate. Are we not just like them, paragons of a perfect friendship? I'm not sure, says the pirate. Would you prefer then, says the pirate, another proverbial pair of companions, Socrates and Alcibiades? No, says the pirate. I mean to say, says the pirate, this, just as an omelet has properties other than the properties of eggs, milk, cheese, and whatever other parts, so a pirate and a parrot are more than a pirate without a parrot, and a parrot without a pirate. Also, the number two is not the same as two ones. It's an even number and they aren't. Socrates says this in Hippias Major. Socrates can say whatever he pleases, says the parrot, but I still don't feel we relate to each other. I feel you're a stranger to me, pirate. You can't make me out, really. You think I'm some interchangeable bird. Oh no, says the pirate. How can you even say that? Is it the night, the darkness? No, parrot, stars shine even if clouds cover them. And the two of us are on the deck of a ship headed somewhere, God knows where, and we're headed together. But maybe it wasn't meant like that, says the parrot. Maybe we're here by chance. Thanks. Thank you for that, that wonderful performance. Good to hear the voices. And, and now we'll pass it to Edwin, please. Thanks. There we go. All right, I'm actually gonna read um, a translation that I did a couple of years ago. Um, Albert Mobilio commis uh, commissioned a, a piece as it were um, on, he gives you a subject to write about. And the subject in this case was laughter. And when you, um, when I read the poem by Baudelaire that I'm going to read, that will seem a, an unusual thing to have, an unusual poem to have translated in that context. Anyway, I'm going to read a translation of Baudelaire's The Voyage, uh, um, a big poem in several sections that won't go on forever. Um, it's also an ex exercise in places in anachronism, uh, also an exercise in uh, occasional mistranslation, the first line. Uh, I use stamps, which is actually the French word millions prints, but it's um, it's both it's also a kind of anachronism to mistranslate there. And finally, uh, also as with um, Arvin's Kabir, there is an element of of um, formal adaptation uh, in that I dispense with Baudelaire's stanzas, which are are um, an important part of Baudelaire's effect. These sort of classical stanzas with his um, non-classical uh, subject matter, but this allows some of the, um, uh, as I'm writing in, in meter at the same time, it allows some of the, um, the uh, propulsive energy, which is also part of Baudelaire, I think, to come out or something that, that actually English can touch in those poems, I hope emerges. Anyway, here's the poem. The Voyage One. For the child who is in love with maps and stamps, the world is equal to his appetite for all the world. Under the lamplight, how vast it all must seem, remembered though the world is small. One morning we get up and go, with burning heads, resentful hearts, and bitter dreams we go, striking out for the end of the world in search of what's unending. The long waves roll out in our wake, 
and some are fleeing a country gone bad, and some their cradle, some a person, stargazers who drowned in pretty eyes, Circe's pets steeped in perfume and danger, who now drink light and space and burning skies to excess, to feel that they are human beings, not beasts. The ice gnaws them, the sun roasts them, slowly the marks of ancient kisses fade away. But the true voyagers are those who go simply to go. Lighthearted as balloons, it's their fate they know. They can't escape, and without any idea why, they simply say, let's go. Their desire is a cloud. Like a new conscript, they dream of vast, voluptuous, shifting, uncertain, unknown things, of things without a name. Two. Horrors, we spin around and jump like tops, and even when we sleep, curiosity torments and drives us on, a cruel angel whipping up suns. What a singular misfortune we suffer from, to have nothing to do but to go somewhere else, and never being anywhere really, to have nowhere to go, even as humanity can only hope, like madmen we run in search of a place of rest. Our soul is a three master steering for harbor, from the bridge, a yell, watch out, from the crow's nest, a yodel, love, happiness, shit, we've hit a rock. And yet the watchman's cry always signals a farther El Dorado destiny has in mind, while the imagination after last night's orgy come morning finds nothing but a sinkhole or a shoal. Poor things, infatuates of the non-existent, do you put him in shackles or throw him in the sea, this tosspot sailor dreaming America's up, mirages where the abyss only opens more deep, the way an old homeless bastard stuck in the mud with his nose in the air conjures a paradise, a true palazzo, and the light switch lights a dump. Three, <clears throat> amazing voyagers, what stories we can read within your eyes as deep as oceans. Open your baggage up, bowl us over with the things you've picked up on the way. Those crazy jewels, all atmosphere and stars, and without steam or sail, with souls that are as taut as sails, we'll listen. Lighten the sentence of our days of boredom. Project on the horizon screen your dazzling memories. Tell us, what have you seen? Four, stars and waves and sand and still, Notwithstanding reverses and unforeseen disasters, we were bored, bored just as we were before. Those glorious suns, those raging seas, those glorious cities in the setting sun left nothing in us but a nagging ardor to melt away in some mesmerizing sky. The richest of cities, the most extraordinary landscape where nothing is co as compared to one, were nothing as compared to one chance cloud and wishes were mostly worries or satisfied Desire only returned with greater force. Desire, that great tree with roots that feed on the dirt it grows in, trunk thickening, bark coarsening, but its branches still go on reaching for the sky. An enormous tree, and will it just go on growing, even more greedy than the graveyard cypress? Well, anyway, perhaps the things we picked up along the way can fill a hole in your albums, brothers and sisters who also imagine whatever's far, far off is beautiful idols with dangling trunks, thrones budding with jewels and palaces, so overstuffed, so weird and wacky, they would beggar a financier's wettest dream. We've seen it all, as we have also seen exotic costumes to tantalize the eye, women with sharpened teeth and hennaed palms, street dancers swaying in a snake's caress. Yes, and what more, what more, what more? Oh, children, what else except the main thing? which we saw everywhere without even having to look from the top to the bottom of the ladder, the whole dreary spectacle of sin at work, day in, day out, undying. Woman, a vile slave, as proud as stupid, prostrate with humorless adoration, not even feeling a hint of disgust. And man, a gluttonous tyrant, hard, grasping, dirty-minded, enslaved by his slave, his image sprawling in the gutter's ooze. The executioner's joy, the martyr's sob, and the after party, blood with salt and pepper. Power, the poison of Democrat and despot, and the people kissing the brutalizing lash. Religions like ours scrabbling toward heaven, sickly holiness shivering underneath a blanket featly or perched on a comfy seat. Blathering humanity full of its own unheard of genius 
as always, and mad about something or other in an agony of blustering fury. Oh God, my own, my master, fuck you. With the smartest of all the poor fools, the mavens of early dementia who flee the herd to take refuge in an opiated daze all over the world. That's the news of the day. It's a bitter dose the Voyager brings back, the world's dull and small, yesterday, today, tomorrow, forever, exactly as we are. The oasis of horror is it, or the desert of boredom? You will leave the casino played out, bankrupt. Do you leave? Do you stay? If you can stay, stay, or go if you have to. Some run, some drag their feet to trick the lurking enemy whose eye stays on the mark, time I mean. Though there are few, the wandering Jew, the 12 apostles, for whom nothing is enough, and whether by horse cart or who knows what, they flee the stalking gladiator. Others, before they skip the cradle, have done themselves to death. But the foot is on our neck, we feel its pressure, and onward we cry, onward we go in hope. And just as before we left for China, eyes fixed on the horizon, hair blown back, now we set forth upon the sea of shadows with hearts as giddy as in the first of youth. Listen to that, those voices, solemn, sad, charming, singing, come this way if you want to sup on fragrant lotus. Here you can pick the miracle fruit that you have always craved. It is strange and sweet, and it will make you drunk all afternoon, at least. We know the song, we know the singers, the young man with open arms, the woman you knelt down to once, kissing her thighs open. Now she's telling you, move on. Death. Old captain, it's time, anchors away. We're bored here, death, hoist the sails. The sky and sea are black as ink, but the lights within our hearts are blazing. Dispense your poison, death, comfort us, death. Our heads are burning, hell or heaven, whatever, whatever abyss now gapes before us, we'll go. If it's unknown, it's new. Thank you very much. That was wonderful to hear. Thank you. Just all three of you getting those voices live. Good, good move. Um, and I think now, why don't we move to say another 10 minutes or so of discussion and then open it up to a few questions because there are questions that are coming in and they'll help direct the discussion in new directions. Um, one thing in the ideas that you three were sharing a little bit with email, came up the notion of the field of poetry. And, and Eugene phrased that, quote, how it's not domestic slash foreign or original plus translated, but one single field. And I would love to hear your all three of your takes on that, but also thinking about how a press helps constitute that field and maybe helps unify it or maybe helps erase those distinctions. So um, I don't know, maybe Edwin, you want to start and others come in? Sure. Um, I mean, it interests me. I mean, I think there is a reason that I wanted to publish uh, Arvin's work in Eugene's and it partly is the questions of, of what is what is an expressive, adequate language? What is language, frankly, uh, is a question that uh, repeatedly arises in, in Eugene's work. Uh, what does it, um, and poetry is in a way, I think, uh, and you, a way, I mean, we'll go back to Arvind saying that he found his natural voice in a voice from the other side of the world. Um, and that that was a way to say things about very specifically Indian situations, uh, not only, I mean, he's been writing poems recently about his garden and it's a garden unlike any garden you would ever see in America. So, I mean, it's interesting that you have to, to that one's native language may be precisely the language that is not one's native language. Equally, of course, there's the issue that comes up of, of having an inherited language um, that, um, that doesn't seem to say what you have to say anymore. So, I mean, I think those, the push and pull between those different if forever unresolved opportunities and, and, and problems is something that um, at least I've tried to um, bring out. One of the first books, it actually is also a book that I published in the classic series, but then I put it into the poetry series, was uh, Rossetti's translation of Dante, which is both, and it was one way of trying to avoid the way in which translations, I think Eugene and the correspondence worried about everything being turned into a kind of flattened American. 
Um, and so um, I often say in translating, this is more often in prose, it's all right for translations to have a slight accent, but the ac that, um, but there's a point where actually the accent becomes also, it, it can't be too much of one, it's a peculiar thing. Anyway, but with doing the Rossetti, it was both a different accent in English, because Rossetti is a, is a Victorian English, and it's, um, but it was also an absolutely crucial book for Robert Duncan, and then Michael Palmer wrote a, a fine introduction for it, and it also takes us back to the whole lyric tradition uh, and, the, uh, and the beginnings of lyric poetry in, Frank, in the West. Um, so it's a medieval poem too at the same time. So that, that kind of uh, collision uh, was something that interests me and that I, I um, that encounter or collision uh, is something that as an editor, I hope to, to uh, make happen. Eugene, you want to come in maybe with something yeah. about your thinking? Okay. I mean, I, I think uh, when we were emailing about this earlier, um, a point came up, which is much the same point that Edwin had made, and now I want to revisit it again. So I think it's very, I think, the look of the books is very important. I think I think it it really sends a message. I've actually I've been working um, in on like history of the avant-garde book in 1913. So now I can kind of pay more attention to how books look like. The fact that it's typography on the cover and not art, mm -hmm. right? The fact that we're basically dealing with the same typefaces. Mm -hmm. um, for everybody, and the fact that the variation is only that there are all these minor, the variations are all very minor, it's just the name itself, right? Uh, um, and the color of the book, right? And that says something really, really profound about uh, the way all these really uh, disparate instances of language use that are very, very different, um, that come from different cultures and different times, um, in the way that the press kind of brings them together, not so much to affirm their sameness as to affirm their commonality, which is really not the same thing at all, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I find there's a, and this, a kind of fraternity, well, not in the not in the collegiate sense of the word, right? Mm -hmm. But in the in the in the French sense of the word, that you know, there's there's a liberty, egality, fraternity to, to this kind of bringing them together and saying they belong together, right? Um, even though they're, they're they're all quite different, and I find that I don't know, I just find it very liberating. I just like that as. Uh, you know, a book is a speaking object, and this is yet another way in which these books uh, say things that I find interesting. So. Well, I couldn't yeah. have better. <laughs> and Arvind, do you want to say the field idea from your perspective? You also brought up something uh, really interesting in that email exchange about that. About the about the uh, yeah about the field, uh, you know. That I keep talking of India because that's where I'm from, and and I write in English. But when I started writing in English, let's say in the 1960s, there was no field I could belong to. You know, where is my field? So the field had to be constructed. And it had to be constructed through, you know, Europe, through England, through the United States. So that, so that field, it was not my experience, it was the experience of a lot of poets of that generation who, who I mean, we were reading everything. I mean, we were reading Akma Tova, we were reading Mandelstam, we were reading Hope Against Hope, we were, you know. So when, when another republic came out, who edited another, Charles Semich and Mark Strand, Strand, yes. Yeah, so uh, we knew those guys. So I, I, I still don't know what that fuss was about. Because all of those Nicanor Para and all those people who were, appeared in another republic, 
had already been around in India through the 60s and 70s through, through Penguin. So these fields have become very interesting because Tan was just one, one field that Tan created. But then the Penguin poets, the Penguin modern poets, Murphy, Silk and Tan, one volume, Ginsburg, Ferlinghetti, Corso, another volume. You remember those, uh, uh, Edwin? You, Very well. Uh, the Penguin, yeah, the Penguin. So they ran on to 22, 23, 24 volumes. So that was one. Then there was the Penguin, the Alvarez edited. So yeah. that was another yeah. similar set of books that Eugene was talking about. So, so we, we ran, bumped into all these fields when we were 18, 17 years old. So this was long before the internet, but also, you know, a hundred and say this was in the 1870s, uh, a Bengali writer or an English writer, Toru Dutt, who lived in Calcutta, who died at 21, 22. She translated 300 poems from the French. Hmm. And she died at 21 of tuberculosis. And one of her last letters, she's awaiting a copy of Nadam Bovary. Hmm. If she'd ordered it, it would have arrived by ship from Paris. She died in 1871 or 72. So this kind of fields, I think writers have always been created. So you belong to your own little hole, but then there is that larger field you belong to. And sometimes you arrive at you to your hole you know, you know, by a long way around. You know, I arrived to India by Rutherford, New Jersey. All I had to go was to look at Bombay but, the re but I could only look at Bombay via this detour, mm. which, I, which I met, which, which is the case with a lot of, with a lot of poets. So I'm, I'm not, you know. Well, you mentioned Pound yeah. to begin with. And of course it is, a, it is a Poundian, a sort of Poundian model of tradition, which is to say it's all a sort of simultaneity exists. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah all, all ages are contemporaneous in the mind. <laughs> So it's a, it's it's what it's what Eliot uh, Weinberger talks about. You know, it's the this invention of American poetry it wouldn't have happened without the discovery of the Chinese. So we had to discover the image, which was in our backyard, but we had to discover the long way around. So you know, that's that's so that's the feel. That's the that's the feel that Eugene is. <laughs> that's the way. That's my perspective on the on the field. Great, thank, thank you for that. And this might be a great moment to kind of open up the field to um, questions from those of you there. So uh, I'll, I'll let Malika kind of take it over. Thank you so much, Cole. And thank you, um, everyone. This conversation has been uh, fantastic. And I feel like kind of a hybrid form um, and really like deeply nourishing. Um, we have three questions and we'll try and get to them kind of rapid fire. Our first will come from our uh, dearly beloved Lynn Crawford, who always has a beautiful background. Um, Lynn, you can take the mic. Hi, thank you so much. Um, this was informative and deeply touching. And the, the question that I thought of is, um, or the topic is discovering books. And I don't know about you, but for me, um, decades ago, it was browsing in bookshops and it was sort of being a little independent and rebellious and not reading what my parents gave me or was, um, you know, uh, you know, given by anyone or school, but being in bookshelves, spending a lot of time on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon. And I have these books that are like 40 years old that I found that way. And I'm just wondering now, um, with fewer bookstores and not being able to be at a shelf and take a book out and look at it and see who gave it a quote and see what the references are. I mean, it could almost be a whole detective project, mm -hmm. um, finding books and being able to touch them and smell them. And I mean, right now I'm writing a piece about George Perec and I happen to have a review of contemporary fiction where there's an interview with him, which is not online. I couldn't find it anywhere, but thank God I have this book that I've had for decades. So I'm just curious, um, given the landscape of books themselves and access to them and younger people uh, discovering them, what your thoughts are. Um, shall I take, pick that up as simply, since I actually, uh, I, I also make books, <laughs> to go into bookstores yeah. and so on. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, I had very much the same sort of experience and, and books are, you know, uh, sort of, you know, Madeleines in that way. I can remember them extremely vividly from early points when my encounter with the physical objects and so on. And I, um, so I think it is important. It was also very important about learning from music. Liner notes used to be something that when you could go to the, you could go to a store and look at records and find out something about the music. And it does seem to me a weird moment that we live in now where you have all these things virtually. You can find out a lot of information about, um, you know, a composer you're interested in or, or anything, but you have to know to find out about it. You can't, you can't, uh, and you can't chance on it in a way though, or you depend on the algorithms that are, are fed to you, which is curiously uh, disheartening. Yeah. Um, the good thing I think is that people are, um, I mean, certainly uh, people my age are nostalgic for that experience. Um, I can remember when I was 19 and went to India and the books I got along the way there, I could get a complete Marx for something like $4 because the Soviets sold them out of, uh, out of, out of vans. Um, anyway, but, um, uh, and I think people crave it so that there has been, an, I think, you know, independent bookstores um, have been wonderful to our books and uh, feature, set them apart and feature them so that people can uh, encounter them. And used bookstores remain, remain, for example, in Brooklyn, there's the great unnameable books, which is perhaps the best poetry store. It's used and new. Um, so um, anyway, I mean, I think there is a, 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 a rear guard action against the, the bleaching out of all the death of experience, which after all, everybody's been bemoaning since Walter Benjamin. So it's just, you know, at least we, we still seem to be alive after all that time. Thank you. That's a Brilliant answer. Um, I'm so sorry to rush it along, but we have a next brilliant question. Uh, so our next question will come from Forrest Gander, um, one of my favorite poets and translators and Zoom people. Uh, Forrest, you can turn on your microphone. And thank you, Malvika. <laughs> um, what a cool group and discussion and reading and talk about poetry and translation. I have a particular question, um, sort of about internationality. Um, since Arvind's work is so influenced by American lyric, but also by classical Chinese poetry, and that his focus on domesticity is often kind of cross-cultural. It's not particularly located in, uh, in, uh, in a culture, even a, a poem like that um, witch poem. Um, uh, could could occur with any uh, a number of countries where people are persecuted. I'm wondering, do you think of yourself, Arvind, as an international poet more than um, an Indian poet, or does that kind of question even make sense? Uh, no, that certainly certainly makes sense. Uh, first, I obviously I think of myself an, as an Indian poet. I can't I can't be any poet of any other kind. Uh, I tried to be an American poet uh, for a few years, but it was it was rather difficult, and I thought it might be easier to be an American poet in India than to be an American <laughs> poet in uh, in uh, where say in Des Moines or you know so so. so. so I, I really I, I spent a couple of years uh, you know uh, uh, in Iowa City at the Tatasha writing program, and it was very tempting. You know, all, all you had to do was change your visa status, and you you know uh, join complete or something like that. Uh, but uh, no, but uh, no, uh, I'm very much an Indian poet, though, though given the field that we all have been talking about, to some extent, a lot of us are international poets. And if I, because the influences come from everywhere, the things, the, the things we read and the things we read from, from very early on. So, especially if you are an Indian poet and you write in English, then you have to make a tradition as you go along. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it, or some of it comes from India, but some of it obviously, as you mentioned, comes from America, comes from the Chinese. Yeah. So to that extent, one is international. I think I would love to sort of pass the same question of nationality to uh, Eugene. Do you see yourself as a national poet or do you see yourself as a kind of an internationalist? Um, I think it would be very hard for me not to see myself as an internationalist simply because I was born in one country. I 
grew up in another country whose language I write. Uh, I'm now in Berlin. Uh, but I mean, I'm not, I'm an internationalist, but a very particular kind of internationalist, very narrow kind of internationalist, if that makes sense. Um, I collide the Russian and the American traditions, which are very, very dissimilar. Um, and, and see what kind of chaos results. So it's not like a, I'm international everywhere, but in this particular one thing. Thank you so much. Um, I love that idea of the narrow, the narrow practice. Um, our next question will come from Elizabeth Lockian, a writer and conversationalist, uh, who I'm lucky to call my comrade in arms at the rail. Thank you, Malvika. Um, thank you, everyone, for this wonderful discussion, and especially for the beautiful readings you all did. Um, I'm a big fan of the New York Review books. Have lots of them on my bookshelf. I'm wondering if there are any dream titles that you haven't yet um, republished, and if so, what are they? Oh dear, I mean, I can think of ones I, I, I missed along the way. Uh, for example, uh, in, uh, Malvina by Igor Bachman was one I would have loved to have published. Um, and, uh, and there are, um, I don't know that I have anything, and I might, I don't think, I have anything, um, we have some interesting books coming up, it would be easier to say, which I never expected I would uh, uh, chance on. For example, we have a, a, a book called Mojo Hand by a, a woman, J.J. Uh, Phillips, who's still alive. Um, this is in the classic series, which was published in the early 60s and um, is a novel about uh, a young woman who, uh, who uh, uh, basically, uh, basically has an affair with an old blues singer, a young black woman who goes south. And, um, and it's not perhaps the world's best idea of a, of a human relationship, but it's, it's a straight, it's also a book about the Orpheus myth. Uh, and so it is a peculiar mixture of, of comedy. Um, it's a book I never, it's the kind of book I really like to find out about because I never would have imagined this book. Um, and, uh, and it really is an, an entirely original book. Um, and uh, so that's the sort of thing that I, in a way, look out for. And over the years, have been happy to discover another case that would be the, the great Hungarian writer, Gyula Krudi, who's very well known to Hungarians, but essentially unknown uh, here, who is a writer. I mean, again, you have the feeling you've never, you, you make, awkward comparisons and that Crudy reminds you me a bit of a cross between P.G. Wodehouse and Bruno Schultz. And it doesn't, you know, and, um, but an astonishing and beautiful and, and lyrical and also very funny writer. Um, and so, but again, something one never would have expected. I think they're partly of the things that Hungary is so apart from in, in international literature in some ways, uh, linguistically that it produces, uh, fascinating hybrids, orchids, um, and so on. But uh, um, so those are the sorts of things that I, I hope to um, encounter, the unexpected. If we can, for a moment, pass the same question uh, to everyone else, you know, are there sort of dream books that you would love to see published? Um, that you'd love to see recirculated or the light of day? We, we are very, we always are keen on getting suggestions and we get a lot, but, but don't anybody hesitate, please. <laughs> I think maybe that might be too, too forward of a question. Um, so in the interest of time, um, we do have one final question. It's kind of a compilation of uh, different types of questions that have come in. Um, so I'll just ask the compiled version. Uh, we have a lot of writers, young writers, young artists in the audience of these events traditionally, and I was wondering of um, the four of you, including you, Cole, uh, you know, advice to a young person after the tradition of Rilke, who is writing but maybe not published yet, hasn't quite published, it, you know, is trying to break into the industry of which uh, you're all kind of on the inside but from different perspectives. Um, and this is also a question about kind of advice to yourself. Uh, 
as a younger person, you know, what do you know now that you didn't know then that you would tell yourself? Um, Maybe I'll leap in because my question, my answer is extremely short. Read. <laughs> um, I'm going to actually quote from one of the poets I published, W.S. Graham, who has a wonderful poem in several parts called jo Johann Joachim Quantz's Five Lessons. And at the end, the student is sent on his way by the teacher. And the last lines are, what can I say more? Do not be sentimental or in your art. I will miss you. Do not expect applause. I, I can add something to that. Do not be sentimental. Um, um, there are non-literary texts. Um, that are actually very interesting as models of, of literature. Um, I, the, I think the one time that I taught creative writing or one of the two times that I taught creative writing, I had students read descriptions of different bird and animal species from like, from like Audubon books, like, like those kinds of things. Um, and analyze them as if they were poems. Because what's amazing about them, well, first of all, they're exquisitely written. Uh, but also uh, how much they manage to say in several words and how full of, I don't know, the pathos and tragedy of nature that is without saying anything explicit. Right, with just keeping everything in the negative space. Um, so I think being on the lookout for these weird texts that are not like earmarked as as, as literary, um, I think that that might be very useful for them. Thank you so yeah, much. Uh, for... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I was, I was just, you know, I think what Cole said and what Eugene said about, about reading. And I think there's a wonderful palm statement that I always remember, which is about the, you see, I think he said, a study with the mind of a grandson and watch the time like a hawk. So I think that's, that's, the, that's the kind of advice one would, uh, one would give to, to, to anyone, really, let alone a... <laughs> And also learn foreign languages because mm. there's nothing that, that shows your own language to you like other languages. Oh, I love that's that. A, that's a great way maybe to segue toward the end. Uh, Edwin, would you like to read us one ending poem so that we can end with a poem in the air? All right. Um, all right, I'll read a uh, very short poem from my own book, Snake Train. Um, which is part of a larger sequence that is seasonal in its structure. If I can find it. It's called Virginia. Copperhead coiled in the dust of the road by day. At night, the bullfrogs booming out of the high fringed Victorian trees. The heel of your sandal flattens the soft new grass. How else could the world go on? Mm. Thank you. That's a, a wonderful way to end. And thank you all for your ideas and discussions. And thanks again to the Brooklyn Rail for hosting the conversation. And it is a series. We will be doing more of these. So please keep an eye on the Brooklyn Rail uh, and come and join us for the next one. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to say thank you to Cole for bringing us all together, for bringing us the series. Uh, and I want to say, you know, opening up the space so beautifully. Uh, as always, we'll share the video recording of this uh, event on our archives. So it will be available in a few short days if you want to revisit this magical space. And please join us again tomorrow when we're joined by artist Dominique Fung. 
in conversation with Rail editor Jessica Holmes. Um, and that'll conclude with a reading from Ty Cooper. Uh, that will be, as always, at 1 p.m. Eastern right here in the Zoom. Other than that, uh, thank you all so much. And I'd love to invite you to turn on your microphones uh, if you'd like to say hello to one another or goodbye on your way out or anything else that kind of strikes you. Uh, but this was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cole. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. That was so amazing. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you so very much. Thank wonderful, you. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arvin. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you, Edwin. Today Thank was amazing. Great conversation. I look forward Thank to the future. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. It was so wonderful. Thank you, Edwin. Hi, Hi Norma. Hi. Thank you so much. Cole, wonderful. Cole. Have a good trip tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Mr. Edwin. Thank you, Mr. Merotra, for the good read. Mr. Eugene, it was a pleasurable experience. I did have a question for you, but since we are leaving and they wanted to cut me, you know, I see if I could catch up with you last next time. But I, I was just curious to like just to understand what was this scene like while you were writing back in India because like sometimes need social proof. So what was that like as you just like finding your voice in India? Good question. Uh, Thank you. I think, yeah. How did I find my voice in India? No. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you too well. What was the scene like when you were finding your voice in India? Oh, what was the scene like? Oh, there were very few of us. We were very few of us who were writing in English. And uh, but that, that was one thing. And the other thing was that English was supposed to be on its way out. India had just won independence in 47. We were 15 years into independence. Hindi was supposed to be the national language. So like any other new nation, it had to have a national language just so you have a flag. So the writers in English were in a minority. That's what I was saying. So that was the scene in the mid 60s. Thank you, Josh, uh, Joshua, for that uh, beautiful question. Um, and thank you all for coming. I know traditionally Fong uh, says something like really incantatory, like love and peace or solidarity or something at the very end. Um, I can't do that, but maybe Nick Bennett can do that. Uh, love and peace to everyone. And Shall we shall we go and eat our lunch? Courage. <laughs> Love and courage. There That's what go. it is. Okay. Thank